What we're going to go over here is, in my opinion, one of the most, if you're going to know one thing about financial markets, it's this, right? Feel free to let me know if you agree or disagree. But in my opinion, this is the one thing you want to know. And it's in a, a paper uh, called The Only Game in Town, uh, published in the Financial Analyst Journal in 1971. Financial Analyst Journal, very, uh, it's a very good journal, The Only Game in Town. Basically, what this is going to be is the house, which shouldn't be surprising. Uh, the, the author is Walter Baghot. This is a pseudonym. Walter Baghot actually wrote on Lombard Street, A History of the Money Market Centuries Ago. But this paper, one, it's very readable. Uh, it it's started an academic area of research we call market microstructure. So it's, it's an academic paper, but it is short and it's readable. It's, it's, it's really written for a non-academic audience. So definitely uh, read this paper. I'll put a link to the Google Scholar uh, version of this paper in the uh, description. So definitely uh, read the paper. However, I'll summarize a bit of the uh, points here and then the, the main point. First, the paper starts off by uh, making the observation that uh, professional portfolio managers tend to underperform the market. This is true, we knew it in 1971, it's true now. Basically, you might be better off uh, just investing in the S&P 500. So it asks, it, since we have observed this, then why do people try speculating in markets, number one? It asks, why, um, uh, why do we observe wide swings in enthusiasm and why do we see, that's the second question. Then it asks, third, uh, why do we see so inconsistent performance. Sometimes portfolio managers will beat the market and then underperform and so forth. And it posits as an answer that market participants tend to confuse market gains with trading gains. And what this means is, and we, and we do see this, so I'll say this is, this is a correct observation, something I've generally tended to see in markets. If the market's going up, then people tend to trade and they tend to be on the long side, they're buying stocks. So, they're making money and they tend to confuse they think well I'm a really good stock speculator because I'm making money without realizing that they're making money simply because the market's going up so they're confused they're, they're thinking they're much better than they are uh, they're making money because the market's going up but they think it's because they're an expert trader this tends to be magnified by the fact that uh, many traders particularly you know often very inexperienced will tend to trade high beta stocks so uh, very risky things, maybe Snapchat and, and, and stocks with, 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 uh, that have, are very sensitive to market movement. So when the market's going up, they're in these high beta stocks saying, oh, look at me, I'm outperforming the market. When in reality, they're not outperforming the market, they are just buying high beta. So when the market goes up, they're going to make more, but when the market goes down, they're going to lose more. So that's just, this is why when markets tend to crash, uh, these speculators tend to lose a lot of money. So the very correct observation. However, getting into the meat of what I want to talk to you about here, this is uh, the second page, page 13 here, middle, uh, middle column, the market maker key to the stock market game. So the author says, well, people tend to speculate because they have this idea. And the idea that they have is, well, if I trade randomly, uh, since a stock is about 50% chance it'll go up, 50% chance it'll go down. If I trade randomly, then I should break even. And if I trade randomly and break even, then if I have even a slight idea, then I can beat them, I can, I can do better, right? Even if I have just a, just a general, a, a very small bit of information, then I should be a 51% chance that I'm right, and, and therefore I will make money. Now, the idea of this is fundamentally wrong. So what we want to know, what we want to learn here is that if you are to trade randomly, in fact, you'll lose, right? So uh, why? Well, the idea is when you trade, you trade against uh, or uh, you trade with a market maker. You can say against or with, but the idea is the market maker is in the market always posting a price at which they'll buy and a price at which they'll sell. So the market maker will sell at $50.05 and buy at $50.01. So if you're randomly trading in this market, well, you're going you're gonna to buy here at $50.05 and you're going to sell at $50.01, losing $0.04 cents on every share traded. So you're going to lose. Now, very often students will say, well, what if I use limit orders? Keep in mind, if you use limit orders uh, here, try to post the bids and ask, you're not generally going to react to inf new information that quick and you're going to get adversely selected. So really, if you're trading randomly, whether you use market limit orders, you are going to lose. 
right? So given that, let's look at a little bit of, about what uh, the market maker does, what, what a market looks like. So what a market maker does, again, is posts these bids and asks and trades against roughly three types of traders. Uh, these traders are informed, liquidity, and noise trading. So the idea of this is, and this is really where it sparked a lot of you know, academic research, is there are traders in the market who know what the price should be. Right? Uh, they have uh, information that others don't. Keep in mind, this is, I'm not saying this is illegal, this is not inside information. I'm saying they, they are somehow informed. This could be through their own research. I, I can give you a couple examples of, of, of how they might be informed. Well, I'll give you an example now just to, so we're clear on what informed is. Not saying that this is a way to become informed, uh, but uh, I've heard, you know, I talked to a lot of people in natural gas markets and, and some uh, people at a fund were mentioning they can tell how much gas is in storage by observing the condensation on hills, the amount of dew, just like you can see if a glass is full, a glass of water by the condensation outside the glass. So they'll try to get it, uh, they'll try to, to learn information that the market doesn't have, therefore become informed uh, through looking at the amount of dew on the side of, of hills. The natural gas is stored in hills, right? uh, salt caverns underground and so forth. So that's a way to become informed. But the idea is informed traders have information that the market doesn't have. So whenever they trade, they make money. That's why I have a, a, a minus here. The market maker always lose to, loses to informed traders. Now, the reason why they always lose is let's say the, the informed trader knows that the price should be $50.10. Well, then they're going to buy here at $50.05 and make that five cents. But if the, if the informed trader knows that the price should be $50.03, they don't trade. Right? So a market maker has the op affirmative obligation to trade, whereas the informed trader does not. So they only trade when they're going to make money. So the market maker always loses to the informed. And as an aside, I'll mention this is where a lot of academic research is built on. Or this is what it, a lot is built on because now we can realize what a market maker is trying to do is realize what trades are informed and what are not. Because the market maker doesn't know who they're trading against. They know there's three broad categories, but they the trades are not tagged as they come in, so the market maker tries to figure out what's the probability that this person is informed, and if they are informed, they will react, they will move uh, the bid and ask more in response to that trade, but if they're uninformed, they won't move the bid and ask. So the main thing to understand here is that market makers lose to the informed. Now, the second category here is liquidity. Liquidity traders are basically, I mean, this is, this is me, this is uh, liquidity traders trade uh, based on, uh, you know, I'm getting a part of my paycheck. I put a part of my paycheck in uh, SPY and stock. I hold it for 30 years and then in retirement, I sell that stock. So the idea, this is your typical liquidity trader. So on any given day, I might be putting money into the market to hold for, invest for 30 years. Somebody might be getting, you know, cashing in their 401k and taking that money out of the market. So the market maker, always gains from these liquidity traders. They're not trading off of any sort of information. I am just uh, investing or, or um, uh, selling my investments. So the idea here is, so the idea is liquidity traders, they pay this bid aspirin, which is perfectly fine. I mean, I'm, as a liquidity, as when I buy stock as a liquidity trader, I'm happy to pay the bid aspirin. Uh, what I, I, I'm paying for a service, I'm paying the market maker half the bid aspirin basically to always be there for, whenever I want to buy or sell. The third category, however, well, so what's the problem? First and foremost, what, what we're going to see here is market makers have to make enough off the liquidity traders to cover their losses to the informed, right? So now the problem here is uh, what if market makers, what if, what, you know, what, what if this doesn't cost, cover their losses to the informed, number one, but number two, market makers obviously want to make uh, as large a profit as possible. So is there any way in which market makers can make more money? Can, can they control? See, the problem is market makers cannot make any more liquidity traders. I get part of my paycheck. I invest it in the market. Um, they, they, can't, they can't produce more liquidity traders. Uh, there's basically a set amount of liquidity trading. 
they could adjust the bid ask spread, but uh, lower it. Maybe there'll be a little bit more liquidity trading, but uh, uh, they're, but they're also getting a smaller spread per liquidity trade. So they really can't affect the amount of li liquidity trading. So that brings us to the third category, and this is something market makers in the financial industry can affect. These are called noise traders. I also have uninformed traders. The key here is these traders think they are informed, right? So this is a group of traders who think they're number one, that they're informed, and they're going to trade like they're category number one, but they're really not. So if they're really not, the market maker is always going to gain off of them. So yeah, this is why I have a plus here. The market maker always gains off of noise traders. Um, so the, the key here is, well, uh, how does the financial industry and the market maker make noise traders, right? So how, how do these come about? And this is where we get into the financial industry, uh, um, uh, the uh, financial press. I'll read, you know, I can read uh, directly from, from the paper here. Uh, the market maker naturally welcomes the cooperation of wirehouses, information services like the Wall Street Journal and so forth. Uh, that broadcasts information that is already in prices. So the idea here is, and the key takeaway from, from this lecture is, if you are looking at the financial news, do not trade off of that. If you trade off of publicly available information, then you are a noise trader. And by trading randomly, by, by trading off of this information, you are just going to pay the bid ask spread and you're going to lose. Now here's an important thing to, to understand. That is not to say don't read the financial press. Uh, I read the American Banker all the time, the Wall Street Journal. The, these are great. I read them to understand what's going on in financial markets, um, to learn about new financial technologies and so forth. The key aspect of what I'm saying here is do not trade based on that information. If you see it in any of these financial uh, news channels, publications, it is already in prices. Uh, the, as a little sideline, maybe I can mention, sometimes I talk to students about, well, how quickly does this information get incorporated into prices if, you, if it's publicly available information? I have some research on this. I'll also put a link to it in the description. It's on how quickly the natural gas market reacts to the storage report, natural gas storage report, which is released 10.30 a.m. every Thursday Eastern time. And long story short, the natural gas market reacts within 50 milliseconds of, of the release at 10.30. Uh, the major part of the reaction is within 20 milliseconds. So within 50 milliseconds, the move is entirely over, most of it done in 20 milliseconds, and it's accurate, meaning the move is not reversed or it, it doesn't continue after that. So the, the, the trade is done within 50 milliseconds. And this is exactly after 10.30. What basically happens here is uh, the, some news agencies get the, the information early, they have their computers right next to high frequency traders' computers, uh, which is right next to the exchange. So exactly at 10.30, like clockwork. Uh, I remember my first looking at the data, it's 18 milliseconds after 10.30, like clockwork, the first trade came in, I mean, it, just every week. So what's really happening is the news is coming out of the news service server exactly at 10.30 to the millisecond, going into the high frequency traders' computer, which made the decision, and then within 18, you know, then goes to the exchange computer and, and uh, the trade is made. So the idea here is, that's how quickly news is incorporated. So anything that you see, read, uh, days old, even if, if it's just a, an announcement on CNBC, right? They come out and say inflation is this, right? You know, that is within long before it ever shows up on TV. So anything you see there, don't trade on it, right? Uh, definitely look at it. Uh, it's interesting, understand, use it to understand the economy, but keep in mind the entire industry would like you to be a noise trader, right? Uh, however, because again, you're always going to lose and you're going to, to uh, um, it's going to increase market maker profit. Uh, so, uh, but this is, you know, so B number one, B number two, and B number three. If I haven't mentioned it, uh, number one, this is possible. So I mentioned, I mentioned the looking at the the condensation outside of storage facilities. There are other ways to be to be number one. The only thing I'll mention here is it is a full-time job, so you can use econometrics and so forth to try to get information that the market doesn't have. It is, you know, it's a very difficult job. But at the end of the day, so you can definitely try to be number one. I always tell my students, definitely we can try to be number one, but it's, it's work. It's not as easy as just watching the TV. Uh, definitely uh, be number two, just uh, do not be number three. If you're ever gonna trade, 
uh, you know, ask, ask yourself, does the market have this information? Uh, and again, you see this in some of the other lectures I have, the market is an information aggregator. It is a very good at aggregating information, so you really have to ask yourself, do I have some information that the, that the market doesn't already have? So, in conclusion, what we can do is look at financial markets like this. Uh, we have a market maker in the middle. A market maker is a you know, a financial market is a mechanism which transfers money from the noise, and we can put liquidity traders here, to the informed trader. And what the so it's transferring money from noise traders to informed traders. And the, what the market maker is trying to do is make enough here to cover their losses here and to earn a profit. And that's what a market maker does. Excellent.